just asked me to make another plea. If you hold up your sheets, if you have not handed them in, um, she will actually come round and what we'll do is we'll get these typed up and get them sent back out. Any more for, Suzanne, there's another one here. Okay, well, welcome back to everyone to the second part of our conference. I'm delighted to see that so many people have, thank you, have um, remained this afternoon. Obviously, the lure of the teddy uh, has, has certainly um, helped people. And I'm sure you're going to find the next set of speakers just as inspirational as Suzanne was um, this morning. And certainly for our next speaker, uh, Katie, earlier on, she was saying to me she's feeling very nervous now, uh, following up after Suzanne, especially after lunch. And I said, don't worry, the teddy is up here. It will look after you. In fact, it has that connection because it's looking up at me right now. And every now and again, I'll just need to make sure that I do look down at it. So can I now introduce our next keynote speaker, who is the child and adolescent public health lead for NHS Health Scotland, Katie Hetherington. Katie has been involved in a number of key policy drivers over the years, but today she's going to talk to us about her work, ACEs. Now, I first of all thought, being an educational person, that was a curriculum for excellence, but it is not. It's about the prevention of adverse childhood experiences. So without further ado, can I invite Katie up to the stage? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah, I was slightly nervous before coming over here this morning and then hearing Suzanne and her um, very inspiring talk and the way she moves across the stage um, and the standing ovation. I was thinking, oh, <laughs> how am I going to follow this? And then my own mother, I'm from Lanarkshire, from Kirkluke, the south, not the north. Um, said when I said I was coming along today she said oh you better be good because we might know people in the audience <laughs> so but um so hopefully this will go okay um so thank you very much it's it's great to be here um and although I joked about following Suzanne it's it's great to hear what she said this morning I think it's really gonna set the scene for what I hope to share with you today so it's really to give you an, an overview of adverse childhood experiences the study which uh, there's been a number of studies around um, ACEs, um, both the original study in the US and more recently in England and Wales, not in Scotland yet. Um, so we're going to give you a bit of an overview of some of the research in that area. Uh, play a film, thought that would um, liven us up after lunch. Uh, and then just share with you what we're doing in Health Scotland and hopefully get you all excited and interested in working with us on some of that. Um, that works. Um, NHS Health Scotland, some of you might be familiar with us. We're a national NHS board focused on creating a fairer, healthier Scotland, tackling health inequalities, and, and hopefully, as we'll uh, learn through this talk, why tackling ACEs is so critical for improving Scotland's health and tackling the inequalities that we have in, in health. Um, we've got a website, we've got all our materials um, on there. Um, this is just a bit of context to what we do as an organisation and those of you in public health will be very familiar with this, the social determinants of health. So these are all the factors that make us healthy and actually very, well, although they're very important, access to health services. We all want our hospitals and our GPs and our um, health services. Actually, all of these other things are just as, if not more important <laughs> for the health and well-being of children, young people, families, um, and the whole of the population. And you'll see childhood experiences is, is in there, as well as housing and education and the communities, the place that, that um, we've talked about already today, social support, family income, and um, good employment, not just any employment, but, but good employment. And if we're gonna have, um, make a difference to Scotland's health and tackling health inequalities, then we need to have action across all of those determinants of health. Um, just back in May, um, the Scottish Public Health Network produced this report called Polishing the Diamonds, which I think is a really inspiring title. 
um, and that tries to bring together what the research tells us around addressing adverse childhood experiences in Scotland and sets out a number of areas for action and it's that bit of work that I'm um, working on now with a range of partners um, from across Scotland um, and reports like these can be really useful in bringing attention to what a lot of people say we know this already we've been working in this area for a long time and actually being able to see it written down has, has really struck a chord with us um, and it's really uh, heartening when you hear that feedback about a report but as Suzanne said as well it's really important to get some of that into our practice and into the action we call it in Health Scotland because we like to make things sound a bit more difficult than they really are knowledge into action or the knowledge into action cycle but that's really what reports like this are trying to do bring some of the evidence base and share it with lots of different people to see how it can can inform our practice um, I'm just going to play a short um, it's about four or five minutes uh, clip which gives an overview of the ACE research I think it'll do it much better than I will by standing up here showing you lots of um, PowerPoint slides so we're going to play that next and then we'll follow on after that
cases tend to get passed down from generation to generation and are common across all income levels, races, and cultures. But increasingly, people of all different professions and backgrounds are coming together to discuss how ACEs affect their communities. They're finding new ways to treat and prevent ACEs. Many doctors are starting to screen their patients for ACEs as part of their medical history. More schools are becoming trauma-informed, considering the source of problem behavior when disciplining their students instead of immediately suspending or expelling them. To learn more about interrupting the cycle of adversity and improving health and well-being for the next generation, please visit kpjrfilms.co. So I hope that was helpful in giving just a very brief overview of the adverse childhood experiences studies that have been done and, and they're summarised a bit more in that, um, that report that we're working on now. Um, Sarah Cooper and Phil Mackey were the authors of that. Um, and one of their conclusions is that, and the film really um, is a, a advertisement for public health really, the evidence of the impact is compelling as is the case for action from both a moral and financial perspective at an individual level and to, repeat, um, to prevent the repeated cycle of intergenerational transmission. Um, so what are adverse childhood experiences? The film talked about that. Stressful events occurring in childhood, such as being a victim of neglect or child abuse. Um, but as well as those direct um, experiences, it's also about growing up in a household where there might have been adults who were um, experiencing alcohol or drug problems, mental health conditions, domestic violence, criminal behaviour. Um, and I think this morning um, just reiterated how important it is to get um, the, the environment in which children are growing up in right in order <coughs> that they are capable of developing empathy and trust and um, a sense of community and, <coughs> and the ability to form and develop good and effective relationships throughout life. Um, that's a, an infographic. I'm going to use quite a lot of infographics, actually. Um, none of them have been developed by us in Scotland. Um, this presentation is, is basically stolen from lots of different uh, people, but I think the, the infographics that are developing around this are, are really powerful and actually a really helpful way of being able to explain what, what we mean when we talk about, about ACEs. Um, Public Health Wales, who I suppose are our counterparts um, in, in Health Scotland, have been doing some great work around adverse childhood experiences. They, uh, Mark Bellis um, has done an ACE survey in, in Wales, and this is some of the things that they have, have found. Um, ACE is working towards um, an ACE-free childhood, an ACE-free society. They're developing a hub in which to share research and practice and bring communities together. And ourselves in Health Scotland are very keen to learn what's going on in Wales. We're stealing all their infographics and all their data at the moment, but we're also really interested in, in finding out how they're doing that um, um, influencing role really around policy and at a government level as well to really get some of these statistics and the research that's been around now for a little while right in front of politicians' um, noses. So from the Welsh ACE study, um, and there's links to their or original studies and they're all presented in a really um, accessible way. So I'd suggest you have a look at them if you want to find out a bit more or if you want to take this after today elsewhere. So some of the things um, compared with no ACEs, those with four or more ACEs are 20 times more likely to have been incarcerated, 16 times more likely to have used crack, cocaine or heroin, and it goes on uh, there. So again, a really powerful message around why it's important to get... Um, get it right. Um, I was pleased to see Suzanne had this slide up earlier. Um, this is um, originally developed from Feliti that did the original ACE um, study and Mark Bellis has used it as well. It's, it's trying to understand that pathway between adverse childhood experiences and how that might play out across the life course. Um, so we talked this morning a little bit around how um, um, 
stress can affect the nervous, hormonal, immune development, brain development, how that might play out in terms of social, emotional and learning problems that you might see in, in schools. So for instance, um, neutral cues might be interpreted as threatening, um, which can then um, spiral and play out in the classroom. Um, it, people might be described as anxious or disengaged learners, um, which might lead to the adoption of health harming behaviors, perhaps as a coping mechanism to numb the pain, um, which can then lead to um, low productivity, non-communicable diseases, which I'll go on to in a minute, and early death. Um, this is just a slide around the intergenerational impact of ACEs. Um, I'll just put it all up. It's, it's between boys and girls. So um, uh, um, female girl um, who has four or more ACEs is five times more likely to get pregnant under the age of 18. Um, is then first child is likely to then um, be four times more likely to go on and have a, a first child under 18. And then if you look back, we're more likely to have been born um, to a mother um, who was under 18. And again, we see a similar pattern with boys. So that just shows how behaviours, in this case sexual behaviours, are hopping across generations. Um, again, another useful infographic from Public Health Wales, um, preventing ACEs. Um, or in this case, we've, we've framed it as the economic and social impact of ACEs. Um, it's modelling work that Mark Bellis has done. So if we can prevent ACEs in the future, then we could reduce heroin, crack cocaine by 66%, incarceration by 65%, violence by 60%. I'll not read them all out. The top lines are quite high. And then the bottom line, unintended pregnancy by 41%, high risk drinking smoking and diet. So these are all the health behaviours that we hear um, being talked about in terms of Scotland's health. We need to eat better, we need to not drink, we need to not take drugs. We've got problems with offending. Our ACEs is at the, the heart of this. Um, just at the end of last year, um, Public Health Wales again published this report which shows the association between ACEs and chronic health outcomes. So here's just an example. I was speaking to the, the Chief Medical Officer's staff earlier in the week, so I thought I would put up some really health service data that would really get them excited about, uh, about ACEs. I'm not sure it worked, um, but they certainly have an interest in it. So diabetes, four or more ACEs, um, four times more likely to develop diabetes, type two, three times more likely to develop respiratory disease, three times more likely to develop heart disease. The graph at the side just shows the earlier onset of these compared to someone with, um, compared to no ACEs. a and &E, we hear a lot about a and &E and the crisis in a and &E. um, That just shows uh, about a and &E attendance, the use of health services. So we've got around 7% of, of those attending A&E in the last 12 months with no ACEs compared to four or with people with four or more ACEs over 17%. Um, so there's real, um, real reasons for investing in childhood and early years to get some of this right. Um, that's just some other um, figures around that. Three times more likely to attend A&E, twice as more likely to be frequently visiting the GP. So is it the symptoms that, that are... It, being sh um, the reasons for going to the GP are, um, or are, are we asking about the underlying reasons around that and more likely to stay in hospital. Um, so where are we in Scotland today and how can ACE research inform our action around improving child health and improving population health, closing the attainment gap? It was great to hear Suzanne talk about that. Um, so this was published just last week. There was quite a lot of media press around it. Um, I was at the Parliament hearing the discussion around it. It's a state of child health report um, by the Royal College of Paediatricians. Um, and recommendations for Scotland include a child health in all policies. Um, one sector does not have all the answers to this. So how can we get cross government across departments and local authorities, the NHS, thinking about the impact on child and family health through all the decisions that we make. I've not read the whole report. Um, it's quite a long one, but it, it flags up again around the gap between 
um, rich and poor. And there was quite a lot of focus around that in the press, actually, about child poverty. So I suggest that's something to have a, have a look at. Um, this was in the news last week as well. Um, this was evidence to the Justice Committee about the amount of time that the police spend on no crime, uh, non-criminal incidents. So a study in West Lothian found that officers were spending, on average, about four and a half hours dealing with a single incident that related to mental health, self-harm, or attempted suicide. So it's just a couple of slides about how we're doing in Scotland at the moment. Um, always like an iceberg, talking about a lot of the symptoms here, A&E, diabetes, drug use, homelessness, um, and we can develop lots of great policies and we can keep chipping away at some of those symptoms. Um, and we, of course, need to think about trauma-informed services and, and mending broken adults, as, as this is a slide that Mark Bellis has used before. Or how do we really use the, the learning and the research and, and what we've heard today from Suzanne to build stronger children and build their internal um, teddy bears? Um, this is a nice infographic as well, which just um, touches on a lot of what we've, we've talked about today. I suppose it's the flip side. Um, we've been in that dark place talking about ACEs, but actually this is what we know builds um, a strong support for, for children to start in life. We've got income, strong bonds, positive relationships, nurturing approaches to help children heal from adversity, safety, crucial, a safe home community, um, not temporary accommodation um, or, or, or lots of different types of accommodation, but, but a, a safe environment for children to learn and play and involving children in decisions that affect them. And the Children's Parliament doing great work around, around some of that. Um, this is a, a report that was done by the Glasgow Centre for Population Health, which is a, a, an overview of all the research that the, the centre has done around what um, supports early years children and young people. So again, it's a useful one to, to look at. Um, I'll just flick through this because of, of time. Um, poverty. Uh, the child's uh, health report that I flagged up talked about the, the gap between um, different communities in terms of children's health. We know that children don't live in isolation. Um, there is no such thing as a baby, as Winnicott has said, and wh as which Suzanne talked about very much uh, this morning. So children um, are affected by their parents' health, by their families' life circumstances, and that can play out both in their health and also in their their education. Um, I'll just flick through that. Um, so, what can we what can we do? What how can we um, respond to to what we know? Um, I've not really gone into this, but poverty and deprivation does underpin ACEs. Uh, it doesn't explain it all, but um, you are more at risk of ACEs if you are living in a more um, a poorer background. Um, we've talked about intergenerational risks, um, but ACEs are hugely prevalent um, and all of us here are affected by ACEs and we can all get up and go to work and, and get through life, so it's not all bad news and the importance of family and social support with that internal teddy bear that we heard about being hugely important. Um, so these are just some of the areas that we're looking at. Raising awareness is a hugely important part, I think, of ACEs. So talking about some of this work, talking about trauma-informed approaches to services, talking about the impact that ACEs have across the life course um, to get a, 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 an understanding across society and across the public sector about ACEs. Um, we had a uh, conference in November around this um, and the slides and the presentations are all available on our website and um, you might be interested interested to go and uh, listen to some of that um, and another thing we're looking at is around showing some film documentaries so that snippet was just um, one of a couple of documentaries and we could have those in community settings we could have those in cities to really raise awareness uh, among society actually about the importance of, of this um, the policy environment I'll not go go into but thinking about how policies might impact um, ACEs and seek to prevent them and respond appropriately. So we've been doing some work with Scottish Government colleagues in justice, in um, health, in education, um, to start to think about how their policies might take account of, of some of this. Um, 
data collection is something that I don't know the answer to um, and interested in people's thoughts on whether we should have an ACE survey in Scotland so that we've got some of our own data because what we're doing at the moment is very much relying around um, some other data from other countries. Would it be useful to really shine a spotlight on ACEs in Scotland if we knew what the prevalence was here? Um, we've heard about trauma-informed practice. Um, Psychologically informed environments, I suppose, is just another way of looking at that. So there's been some work done, and this is through the work that I was involved in around homelessness, um, to think about a psychologically informed environment, which the definition up there is just a place or a service where the overall approach and day-to-day -day running have been consciously designed to meet the psychological and emotional needs of its clients, not convenience, cost, or health and safety. And I suppose it's just a question to us all in the room in terms of our own services and our own policies and the environments in which we're working with people are, is, are, have they been consciously designed to meet those psychological and emotional needs. And an example of that in practice is through street work, um, who are a voluntary sector organisation um, enabling a life off the street and a really important part of what they've done in, in built, adopting a psychologically informed approach is around building relationships with the clients that are using it. Um, and there's been research shown, um, which really shows how um, much better the outcomes are for people when they've, when they've, um, they've taken this approach. So I don't have time to go into that, but um, please come and talk to me if you want to find out a little bit more. But it struck me that, that what street work are doing and what a psychologically informed environment is doing, I suppose is helping grow those teddy bears which I'm, I'm going to refer to teddy bears a lot after today, I think. Um, I've just got a couple of slides here, really, to, to, to just, I suppose, get you thinking. Um, is, it, is it safe to ask people about ACEs? And what do you do with it when you know it? Um, and that often comes up when we start to talk about this. And we did this at, at the conference in November. I'm not sure if any of you were, were there, where the, we had about 200-odd people in the room. And... Um, Michael Smith, the consultant psychiatrist in Greater Glasgow and Clyde, took the audience through an ACE survey, um, really just to, to demonstrate that ACEs are all around us, that they're in the room with us, that people are survivors, that it's not all doom and gloom, um, but it might be useful to reflect on our own um, histories if we're asking people to think about it in their, in their work. Um, and you can watch Michael do that um, from the conference, from the, the link to the, um, to the conference there. I'm just going to flick through this um, and just leave you really with a couple of, of slides actually um, around this idea of blame, shame and punishment. So Jane Stevens, who runs um, uh, ACE Connections website, uh, writes and talks a lot about ACEs. Uh, it talks about institutional responses to ACEs or to higher ACE scores is often to blame, shame and punish people. Um, not deliberately, and we've spoken about this today, um, but responses to some of the behaviour that we might see in schools, the behaviour we might see in A&E, in GP surgeries, in criminal justice, on the streets, on a Friday night um, or any night, um, might be more about blaming, shaming and punishment. Um, so for instance, mental health services, if people miss appointments, sometimes they're excluded from future appointments. Um, we've already heard about a third of adults um, in prison have been in care. Um, so is it in our culture to be, to be curious about what's happened to people, to empathise, to ask not what's wrong with you, but what's happened to you? and to then respond in an appropriate way where we have understanding, nurturing, and healing. So it's not necessarily always about interventions, ACEs. I suppose it's been about a bit more curious about it, thinking about the impact across the life course. And I really like these words, actually. Um, and I'll just finish with this picture, um, which I don't have permission to use, so don't share it with anyone in case that doesn't go down too well. Um, Michael Smith, who I mentioned, has used this before, uh, and I just like, well, I don't like it, no one likes to point at a baby, but um, I suppose it just en encapsulates some of the, the things that I've talked about. So um, you're going to make a lot of bad choices in your life, choosing the wrong parents, the wrong socioeconomic group, 
the wrong social welfare home, where you're going to get yourself abused. And after that, you're just going to carry on making bad choices till you end up in prison or a psych ward. And when are you going to take some responsibility for yourself? So we never think about pointing at a baby and blaming a baby, a baby. but quite often in later life, we sometimes forget some of this um, and sometimes um, move to that blame, shame and punishment. So it's a good cartoon, I think, interested in what you think about it, but um, check with me once we get permission to use it. <laughs> um, that's just a few acknowledgements of all the slides and the content that I've stolen from, from people there. Um, and I've got lots of links on these slides if you get to share them afterwards, which will give you a lot more information about some of this. So for instance, the presentations and film clips from our speakers at the conference in November, um, the report, um, the original ACE study. Um, there's a Radio 4 program, um, 30 minutes on ACEs. Mark Bellis talks about that. It's got some people talking about their experiences of ACEs. Um, and I think that was a really useful uh, half hour of your time um, over the weekend if you want to look at that. But I'll just finish there. Thank you. Okay, can I just uh, thank uh, Katie once again for certainly wearing uh, 